literally dozens of academic disciplines from well over 100 countries. And uh, one of the uh, exciting individuals we have communicated with for a number of years is Bob Johannes, who comes here from Hobart, Tasmania, uh, in Australia. And uh, Bob is a marine biologist. Uh, his first two degrees were taken at the University of, of uh, British Columbia. And uh, his PhD was at the uh, University of Hawaii. Uh, he was born and brought up as a Canadian and then migrated south and uh, currently lives on two passports, Australian and, and U.S. Uh, he's worked literally all over the Pacific and has written some of the uh, really sterling pieces on the ways in which indigenous peoples have managed their marine biological resources. These are some of the documents that we have in the CCAR documentation unit in 224 Curtis Hall that uh, all of you are welcome to uh, take advantage of if uh, you're, you're interested in these. Um, Bob currently is with the Commonwealth uh, Scientific and Industrial Research Organization and uh, contacted me, uh, it was a couple months ago, saying he had just received a Pew Foundation Fellowship and was heading off to Roanoke, Virginia for meetings and so we got him to drop off in Iowa en route from Tasmania to Virginia and we got him here for a couple of days with us. Uh, within, I think, learning, I think it was 12 hours we had when the students found out the lectures committee was going to meet and it was our only opportunity to try to secure some funding and they went into uh, triple overtime action and it was the Student Society for Indigenous Knowledge and Development that pulled all the paperwork together for it, which we're most grateful as well as Sociology, Anthropology, CCARD, the African Student Association, the Nigerian Student Association, Technology and Social Change Program, Fisheries and Wildlife Biology and of course the Lectures uh, Committee funded by government and the student body. Um, the original title for tonight's talk was the case for, well, indigenous knowledge is it's related to aquatic resource management and the uh, lectures committee felt that would be too boring and nobody would show up so <clears throat> they encouraged us to add a few keywords and we put in conservation of cultural diversity and biodiversity to pull the crowd out and uh, it obviously worked real well. Uh, Anyway, we're very pleased that uh, Bob was able to stop at Iowa State en route to the East Coast and uh, we'll speak for about 50 minutes and that'll leave us uh, five to ten minutes if any of you has any questions. So let me turn the podium over to Bob and uh, I'll pass these around if some of you are interested in uh, chatting with us about C-Card later you can. Bob? Thanks very much, Mike. It's a real pleasure to be here. And it's really exciting to come to a place that I've heard about and read about and corresponded with for quite a number of years and find out how much enthusiasm and how much expertise is going into the study of, of traditional knowledge. And I want to thank uh, Mike and Judy, both Judy over there, um, for working to uh, facilitate this, this talk. And before I start with the usual introduction, I thought I'd start first with a story and then do the inter sort of the introductory part of the talk later. And this uh, diagram here has to do with the story. Now this is a coral atoll. Now this is looking down as we're in a plane. And these rings are islands. ring around here is a shallow coral reef in sand, maybe three to ten feet underwater. Some of it actually exposed to low tide. If you were looking at it as a diver in, in infinitely 
clear water into the ocean it would look like this. This is a, an undersea mountain that gets up about this high, and the coral reefs grow here, grow all the way around. The coral reefs grow to the surface, and the erosion, the wave action causes some of the sand to pile up and create islands. And the distance across here, this particular atoll, is about 25 miles. Okay, I went there with a group of people who were asked by USAID to come up with a management plan for the marine resources of this area. Now, the lagoon and the atoll is heavily overpopulated, and people there relied very heavily on fish. Traditionally, it was essentially their only source of animal protein. And they're very poor. Uh, they're among the few Pacific Islanders who are, are considered by uh, the uh, United Nations as among the lesser developed nations. And so fish is very important to them. Now, when I went there, as is my usual custom, or rather, I'm a marine biologist, but these days, rather than going into the water and asking fish to tell me what they're doing, I go to people, fishermen, to find out what they know, because they've been there for a long time. And whether they eat tomorrow depends on whether they catch fish today. And so the best of them are very observant, and they've forgotten more about the waters in areas like this than <coughs> marine biologists will ever learn. So when I got there, the, the, the capital is concentrated in these two islands. Um, I got a local marine biologist, a, a native of this country, as my interpreter because I didn't speak the language. And I went out to all these islands in sequence, interviewed old time fishermen. Now, the interpreter I had was well educated, bright, personable, highly motivated, and very skeptical. In other words, the perfect person you want with you. Uh, and so it was a joy to work with him. The reason he was skeptical is that this atoll has an extraordinary number of marine biologists, perhaps the highest number per capita of any place I've ever been. And among other things, they had systematically surveyed a lot of fishermen using a, a long questionnaire, not just once, but several times over a period of years. And he was a hot shot with a computer, much better than I am, and he had analyzed this information. With all this effort, with all these fishing in the area, something about like 20% of all the fishing, he had a lot of data. And he thought, what on earth could be accomplished in the three or four days that we've got? So he, but, but as I say, he was very personable, very supportive, and, and uh, went along. Well, the first day, he was skeptical. But the second day, he was getting rather enthusiastic. But the third day, he was really enthusiastic, and he started saying, yeah, we're really getting a great answer to this question. We're really making progress. And by the fourth day, he was my colleague. He was not just interpreting my questions. He was contributing questions, very good questions, in order to enhance the whole project. <coughs> now, we learned a lot of things during the course of these interviews that went sequentially around the island. But I'm just going to tell you about one set of information. It has to do with the bonefish. Bonefish, as a few of you may know, is an important sports fish in the Caribbean. But here, the same species is a very important food fish. In fact, surveys done by my, my colleagues, uh, Fisheries Division, showed that it constituted 20% of the total seafood intake. This one species was very remarkable in the tropics where there are innumerable species of food fish. Now, this fish has an interesting habit that the local people could tell you all about. On every full moon, plus or minus a day, throughout the year, the bonefish would migrate out through certain channels and spawn outside over deep water, just outside the reef edge, because as I showed you before, uh, here's the reef edge, equivalent to this drops off very quickly. So the fish were migrating out here, spawning here, and then moving back in again. Now, in the old days, they were using aerial photographs taken during the Second World War. 
one could see fish traps made of stones piled up on the reef flat out here. Uh, perhaps this would be 50 meters across, 60 or 70 meters long. And as the bonefish migrated back in from their spawning, they would hit here and follow into the trap and get trapped there at low tide. And uh, there was a French terrestrial marine ecologist who had been fortunate to get an interest in fishing below the deep well, below the tree and coconut palms and things like that, who described that around uh, the early 50s what happened when the bonefish migrated back in from their spawning. They got trapped in here and people caught between 400 up in the bad month and 3,000 in the good month of fish averaging one kilogram apiece. Okay, those were in the good old days. Now, in the meantime, there have been several causeways that have been built between islands in order that the increasing number of motorcycles and, and motorbikes and subsequently cars owned by rich government people supported by foreign aid, uh, go back and forth in. Now those causeways were not hollow, they didn't have any bridges, and they blocked the migration of bonefish completely. Now the most important run of bonefish happened to be right here. And this also was the major population center spread between these two islands. They put a causeway across in the bonefish migration. Now, some of the more distant islands from the population center didn't have causeways. But as the bonefish uh, no longer migrated here anymore, the fishermen from here, where the population centers were, would come over here on the days of the full moon, around the full moon, and set their gill nets across here. Now, in the old days, that wouldn't have been permitted because there was a tradition, which I'll talk about more tomorrow to, to a smaller group, uh, that each island owned a particular stretch of reef and <laughs> reef. And in the old days, this could never happen, that everybody would come and sit their heads across here because the locals controlled the fishing and they wouldn't allow it. But the British came in, just like the Americans, the French, the Japanese, and the Germans throughout the Pacific and destroyed or made efforts to destroy this custom because it didn't correspond at the time with our understanding of rational marine resource management. The islands were right, we were wrong, and we now use what's called limited entry in the United States and Australia, all over the modern, sophisticated world they were using in the years centuries before we discovered it. It gives you the incentive to conserve. There's no incentive to conserve what you leave behind is could be ripped off by anyone who comes along. Well, that's the case here today because of what the British did 40, 50 years ago. Okay, so as we went around the islands, we discovered that not only had the causeways blocked some of these migration patterns, paths, but also the gillnets had blocked all the rest except for one to the extent that they'd been exterminated. <coughs> Now this pathway here was the last one left, and the number of fish going to it was going down all the time. And in fact, for several months when we got there, it hadn't uh, happened as it was supposed to around full moon, which is the same kind of symptoms of, of collapse it showed up here. You'd get uh, fish coming every month, and they come every second month, and then they wouldn't come for four or five months, and finally they never came again. Now, this is a fish, remember, that constituted 20% of the catch for a population that relied on fish for their animal protein a lot more heavily than we rely on beef in the United States or sheep in Australia. So, uh, it's, it's a very important fish. Now, because fish produce so many eggs, unlike cattle, uh, a fish when it spawns produces potential tens to hundreds of thousands to millions of eggs. So this spotting run by itself, ignoring all the rest that have been destroyed, produced enough eggs that the population of bonefish in the lagoon, where people also caught them, was still very high. 
So people weren't too worried. We were very worried because once you, this spawning run goes, that's the end. There's no more spawning. In a, in a few years, these live for six or seven years, that'll be end of, the end of 20% of the catch. Um, now, what can we learn from this? Well, my, my colleague, the local marine biologist, as I told you, he got more enthusiastic as time went on, also more depressed because the story developed and we saw the things were in a serious uh, state. Uh, I told you before that he was involved in a major study of fishermen's knowledge involving questionnaires, repeated <coughs> surveys, a large, a large percentage of the fishermen, something like 20 percent is by coincidence. And they had not discovered it. They knew that some of these runs had been blocked up here, but that's all they knew. But why hadn't they learned about this? They hadn't learned about it for two reasons. One is that they're a random sample of fishermen. If you're, if you're a serious scientist with fishing, you should take random samples. And you only sample fishermen that are active. But the population is growing so fast in this atoll that most of the fishermen are very young. And they don't know what the past is like. Most of them are in their 20s. What do they know about the way things were 30 or 40 years ago? And many of the old men who knew a lot about what happened 30 or 40 years ago didn't fish anymore. They were too old to fish. <laughs> they sat on the beach and talked to the other fishermen as they came in. Still very interested in what went on. They didn't qualify for the survey. So they were asked. The other reason this scientific approach failed was that supposing there was a young person or several people amongst the people they interviewed who in fact didn't know about this because his grandfather had told them about it. There was no question on the questionnaire to elicit this information. And these people are rural, they're shy, they only give you the answers that you ask because they're they, they don't know really what you're, what you're there for or why you're asking these questions, and so they don't really volunteer a lot. So even if there was someone who could have provided this information, he didn't <coughs> because he was constrained by a questionnaire. Now, random samples and questionnaires are two of the standard methodologies for conventional scientific research, and they fail miserably here. They failed miserably because they failed to seek out the experts, and then when you find the expert, you don't ask him a rigid list of questions that you've written because that expert knows important things that you don't even know enough to ask about. So what you do is you interview him in such a way that you let him steer the conversation. And when he hits something interesting, uh, then you let him go. You say, okay, let's hear more about that. That's really interesting. But if you don't do that, if you constrain yourself by, by what's often, most unfortunately, called the scientific method, then you're in for a lot of trouble. Um, now, my, my colleague, interestingly, had a master's degree and was intending to go back to university in Australia and get a PhD studying bonefish, just purely by coincidence. And he was going to study the biology of bonefish. But after this episode where we interviewed these people and found out this serious information, he uh, decided to study the ethnobiology of bonefish, which means studying what the local, his, his, his people knew about bonefish, and then going out as a biologist and, and trying to verify this information, trying to make sure that it was correct. So that was a nice development. This, by the way, for a few of you who are aware of, of the term rapid rural appraisal, is the kind of thing that you can pick up by rapid rural appraisal, despite the fact that, that some anthropologists look down their noses at it because it's too quick and dirty. But if, if, if it's quick but directed in the, right, in the right way, it can be very useful. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll start at the beginning now and, and give a, a little bit of an introduction uh, Mike asked me earlier how I got into the study of traditional knowledge. And it seems that everybody got into it by a, by a different route. And I'm a, I was a conventional marine biologist. I spent a lot of time studying the ecology of coral reefs. 
I got my PhD, as Mike said, in Hawaii, which gave me a casual interest in the anthropology of Pacific Islands. And although I'd never taken any courses in social science, I tended, for recreational reading, to read some of the anthropological work that had been done in the Pacific Islands. And I particularly concentrated on, on fishing, which is extremely important to Pacific Islanders. And me too. So that was natural that I, I read this stuff. And I kept coming across tidbits of information suggesting that these fishermen knew some really important things. But it was always suggested, and the reason was that anthropologists, quite reasonably, I'm not being critical, were not trained in marine biology and therefore were not trained to recognize when they got a significant answer, when they got something that would be important to a scientist interested in the sea. So they never followed it up. So I was itching to follow this up. So I gave away my test tubes and closed down my lab and, and got a little money and, and headed out to Palau in Micronesia, which is in the, the uh, northwest quadrant of, of uh, the tropical Pacific, and stayed there with my wife and my then five-year-old son for a year, just in order to find out what, mer what local fishermen knew about marine biology that marine biologists didn't. And I thought that if I was lucky, I could come back and write a paper about it. Well, I came back and wrote a book and eight papers about it, because what I discovered was that these people had an encyclopedic knowledge, hard, practical, verifiable knowledge about what went on in their waters that was completely unknown to marine biologists. And in my reading, I, I also discovered that there had been people before me that had discovered this a long time before me. For example, the fishermen in Oppian's time uh, knew that, uh, that octopus died after they laid their eggs, which is quite unusual. Most species manage to lay, except some insects and certain other tiny things, reproduce several times. But octopus die almost, in, except for one species in Australia, die after the first spawning. They knew that many centuries ago. We uh, verified it, quotation marks, in the 1970s. Aristotle spent a couple of years on an island uh, interviewing fishermen there um, because he was interested in local indigenous knowledge and one of the things they told him were that groupers, which is an important food fish that lives on coral reefs but also lives in the Mediterranean, that they're hermaphroditic, which means as they get older they change from one sex to another. Um, that was Aristotle's time. The fishermen knew it then. We verified it in the late 19th century. Archie Carr, whom a few of you probably will have heard of, is a famous turtle biologist, died a few years ago from Florida. For years he'd been hearing fishermen all over the world say that turtles came back to the same beach to lay their eggs every year or, or a, few, a few years. And nobody else believed it, but Archie decided to check it out. And he found out that it was absolutely true that turtles that migrate thousands of miles in between spawnings, in between nestings, I should say, migrate to the same beach. Now, this is a very powerful tool for conservation because if you know that the turtles on a particular beach belong to one population, and no matter where they go around the world in the meantime, they're still of that one population, they're still related to one another, then you can start doing serious research. And all the research that's done on turtles today, or I shouldn't say all, but 90% of it, is done on wild turtles is done on the nesting beaches based on this knowledge that these turtles belong to a single population. Um, now, when it comes to the Pacific Islands, uh, before my work, nobody had done anything like I did in Palau except for one man. And he was neither an anthropologist nor a marine biologist. He was a novelist. He was Charles Nordoff, the co-author of Mutiny on the Bounty who had spent a lot of time in Tahiti and spent a, a whole year going out with tuna fishermen, traditional tuna fishermen, and studying their methods and, and writing a marvelous article that, that's, that's not journalistic, it's, it's anthropological, it's accurate, it's concise, it's, it's beautiful, um, and uh, describing all the knowledge that these tuna fishermen had. But he acknowledged that there were a great many species of fish inside the reef 
The fisherman also, also knew a lot about, and all he'd studied was tuna, and there was a lot more to be done. And he said, the time is ripe for some trained, uh, no, photocopies blurred here, for some trained person to settle in these islands, learn the language, and devote five years to a complete account of fishing inside and outside the reef. Such a work would assume proportions almost encyclopedic and bring to light a mass of curious data. Now this was in 1933, and nobody picked him up on it until, until I did in 1970-something. And as, as, uh, as I told you, I, I got far more than I bargained for. Well, you might ask, okay, this sounds a little bit interesting, maybe a little bit colorful, but why bother? I mean, there are only 25,000 people on that atoll I showed you. In Micronesia as a whole, there are only uh, a little more than 200,000. And, and in Micronesia, Henry Kissinger is famous because one time when he was debating some uh, policy issue that affected Micronesia, he said, but there are only a hundred and some thousand people out there. That was 20 years ago when that's how many there were. Who gives a damn? Well, there are seven different, eight different cultures out there, eight different languages, eight different ways of looking at the world, eight different ways of laughing, telling jokes, making love, cooking, doing politics. And we are knocking off cultures, percentage-wise, a lot faster than we're knocking off species today, and yet we pay an awful lot less attention to our own cultures than we do to, to species. I don't want to play down the importance of, of maintaining biodiversity, but I want to play up the, the importance of maintaining cultural diversity, and the two go hand in hand, particularly in the Pacific Islands where there's no trading to speak of in most Pacific Islands. There's no dependence upon other places for what you live off. You live off what's right within a few miles of for, for, for your housing, for your clothing, for your, for your food. And so the environment and the culture are interdependent. You destroy, destroy one and, and you're liable to wreck the other. Um, so whereas I started out with a motive simply of studying this knowledge because I was curious, that's all, just curious, I, I became caught up in, in two other things. One was cultural preservation and the other was management and conservation of, of marine resources and became acutely aware of, of how important it was to study local knowledge in order to do this. Now, uh, the other thing that makes this kind of work more important than you might think is that small-scale fishermen, which are often defined as fishermen who invest $2,500 or less in their boats and gear, in other words, a pittance compared to the fishermen we're used to in, in the United States, they are responsible for one half of the world's catch of food fish. Furthermore, they invest one-fifth of the amount of, of capital in order to do so. They use one-fifth the amount of fuel, and that half that they catch employs um, something like a hundred times as many fishermen as the other half that are caught using a lot more energy, a lot more capital, and great big boats. And otherwise, in other words, the artisanal fisheries, the small-scale fisheries, the native fisheries, the three terms are used interdependently, um, are enormously important in, in, the, in the social, in the economic, in the biological scheme of things, but we don't recognize that. And the reason we don't is because these fishermen are poor, they're scattered, they live in small villages typically, and they, know, they have no political clout. They have no uh, overarching organizations to draw attention to themselves, and so the politicians tend to ignore them. Furthermore, an awful lot of their catch is bartered in the village. It doesn't go through a market. And if something doesn't go through a market, as far as economists are concerned, it doesn't exist. If dollars aren't transferred, then forget it. But when you, the most important fisheries in terms of dollar transfer in the Pacific Islands are tuna. But time and time again, if you look at the statistics, you discover that there are more fish caught and consumed, caught locally and consumed locally on the reefs than there are tuna that are exported for dollars. But the politicians don't realize 
it's never occurred to them that each pound of fish that is caught on a local reef and consumed within the village, bartered, given, eaten within the family, represents a pound of fish that doesn't have to be bought from outside and is worth as much to the economy as the tuna. So this is the reason that these, these fisheries are not, are not paid enough attention to. Um, another reason for studying traditional knowledge is that fisheries science, which is a misnomer because there's nothing very scientific about most of it, is doing a very bad job of managing uh, temperate zone fisheries where you're only dealing with a few species. In the tropics you're dealing with a hundred plus species. Now that's not a criticism of marine biologists. The job has turned out to be a, a lot more difficult than they realized and so 45 percent of the species in the United States that are fished commercially off both coasts are known to be seriously overfished. A number of other percent probably are but, but nobody's quite sure because they don't have the statistics. Now, given the fact that marine biologists can't do a good job of managing fish in marine waters, they do a better job in lakes and streams, can't do a decent job by and large in, in the temperate zone, they've got vastly greater problems in the tropics. They've got far more fish, they've got far more methods, each of which selects different fish of different sizes, which complicates their calculations enormously. They have innumerable distribution channels, they land their fish at all hours of day and night, all along the beach in the different villages. There's no central landing place or places like there is with commercial fisheries. All these things make it enormously difficult for the typical, the conventional marine scientist to get the kind of information that is considered necessary to manage the fishery. Under the circumstances, and, and it doesn't seem yet to be realized by a lot of biologists, you don't aim for the kind of things that we normally aim for, which is the maximum sustained yield or the maximum sustained profit or the maximum social benefit or the maximum export value. Those are much too sophisticated. Um, and many of the things, often people when they, when they stand before you, they like to tell you about how, remember th mo mother told you such and such and, and you realize now as you grew up that that she was right? Well, mother or father told you that anything worth doing is worth doing well. Well, that's not right at all. She was decidedly wrong in that case. Um, the choice in the tropics is either to manage imperfectly or, or not manage at all. Ideal management is quite out of the question, beyond the pale. We haven't achieved it in the temperate zone, the problems are much worse, and the available money is much less in the tropics, so forget it. So what we need to do is use the local knowledge that's available. Here is an example where we have one spawning run left. Now at this point we don't aim for maximum yield or maximum profit or maximum export value or mass maximum social benefit. We take steps to protect that run from obliteration. And that is a big step. And yet it doesn't require anything like the sophisticated knowledge that it does in order to achieve these other objectives. But most marine biologists aren't satisfied unless they have the information to choose and work towards the sophisticated objectives. So they do nothing until I've got that information and they never get it, so they end up never doing anything. And I'm not exaggerating. Um, so it's a, a choice is not between perfect and imperfect advice. It's, it's the choice between imperfect advice and nothing at all, and complete collapse. And one, we're concerned with protection rather than control in the kind of management we're dealing with here. Now, I don't want to give you the impression that traditional knowledge is, is all marvelous and wonderful and spot on, because it's not. Just like scientific knowledge or any other kind of knowledge, it's, it's full of imperfections. And you have to know when you're studying this kind of information, you have to have enough background in marine science, in, in, in the case of fisheries knowledge, to recognize the valuable information, differentiate it from information that's correct, but everybody knows it already, and the information which is obviously wrong. And uh, 
one of the examples of information that, that is very misleading is, is if a fisherman tells you overfishing is occurring, he could be wrong. His intuition leads him to make this judgment in a situation where he could well be wrong. And this is a circumstance where the biologist does indeed know more than the fisherman. When you fish a population down, you, the point at which you're getting the maximum yield per unit time from that fishery is a point at which the mean size of the fish has shrunk. You're not catching fish as big as you used to because you've fished out all the slow growing old timers. And the catch rate has decreased to one half to one third of what it was when the, when the fisher, fishing was virgin. Now, decreasing size and, and decreasing catch rate mean to a fisherman the fishing's going all to hell. But within limits, it doesn't really mean that at all. So, just to get across the point that you, you can't accept traditional knowledge as being gospel. You have to be well enough versed in, in, in the, the subject to be able to differentiate between the good knowledge and the not so good knowledge. Well, one of the things I learned in Palau that intrigued me before I got there, I read in several anthropolog anthropological treatises about the moon calendars of Pacific Islanders, and I found five different accounts in which they said the, the fishing was best around the new moon and the full moon. I thought, well, that's interesting. I wonder why that is. And so I set out to find out. And I discovered in Palau that even children knew the answer to it. That is, many different species of reef fish come together in large, dense aggregations in order to spawn at very specific locations, specific seasons, and specific phases of the moon. And for most species, those phases are full moon and new moon. Those happen to coincide with the largest tides. I discovered that the fishermen in Palau knew quite clearly, somewhat more fuzzily, an additional number, but quite clearly, collectively, they could tell me about the spawning seasons, locations, and precise timing of the spawnings of 55 different species of reef fish. Now, this was more knowledge on that subject than was known in the scientific literature for the entire world at that time. Twice, more than twice as much, twice as many species. The reason they knew so much is because this was a time to clean up. This was a time the fish were not only aggregated in large numbers, but they were also rather docile and, more, and less wary than usual. It's like, like a lot of animals, including humans. When they're involved in sex, they're kind of preoccupied and they're not really as concerned as usual with what's going on, including fishermen trying to catch them. So they cleaned up. But the information was important scientifically because scientists can clean up too in a situation like this. The most important thing to know about any stock, whether you're talking about moose or rainbow trout or coral trout, is how many there are in the population. And coral reef fish, fish are spread out thinly all over the reef. All the different species are spread out and counting them and getting some idea of their populations under normal circumstances is extremely difficult and, and it's not worth the effort. But when they come together, and they all, all the adults come together at a time and a place that you know about ahead of time, you can be there, the water's clear typically, the aggregations are in shallow water and you're in a great, great shape to measure, to count the number of fish, get an idea of, of how many there are in the population. You're, and over a period of years of this kind of counting, you can figure out whether there's a, a downward trend or not. And if there's a downward trend and it gets too far down, then you can bring in regulations that, that control the fishing in, uh, on, on the spawning grounds. And in fact, uh, Pacific Islanders did just that in a number of islands and have done so for centuries. The chiefs would say, hey, look, the spawning aggregations are getting too low. Nobody from this village can fish that aggregation. And of course, nobody else could because in those days they owned their own fishing grounds and so it was taboo to everybody else. The, the fishing chief could con control fishing pressure. But as I say, we, we destroyed that custom. The Pacific Islanders invented every basic fisheries conservation measure that we invented centuries before we did. It wasn't until the turn of this past century that we realized that it was possible to overfish marine fish populations. 
The reason for that is that we are continent dwellers, which means two things. One, we have a wide continental shelf with lots of fish, and two, we have large supplies of, of terrestrial animal protein. Um, deer and buffalo in the old days, and cattle and, and sheep and so forth today, and pigs. So we don't rely on the sea as much, but in addition, the sea provides more anyway. These people were surrounded by a very narrow rim of reef for which they depended uh, for 90 plus percent of their animal protein. And very quickly, after a few generations of occupation, they learned that man had the capacity to overharvest. And so they did something about it. They invented uh, size limits, closed seasons, closed spawning grounds, limited entry, all the things that we use today, all the things that we, inv we invented only at the turn of the century because as late as 1888, the famous scientist, British scientist T.H. Uh, Huxley said, and he was one of the members of the British Fishing Commission, said that as far as we scientists are concerned, man is incapable of, of overfishing the sea. We can catch as much as we want. It was only just a few years later that we suddenly discovered that that was not the case. But these local fishermen, it wasn't that they're, I'm, I'm not trying to imbue them with, with superhuman intelligence. It wasn't that they were smarter than, than, than we are necessarily, but simply that they were in a situation where their environmental limits became obvious to them earlier than they became obvious to us. And so they invented all these traditional conservation methods, and we colonialists, be we American or, or German or Japanese or French or Australian uh, or British, tended to destroy them because we thought they were primitive when we went in. Um, these spawning aggregations, by the way, can be obliterated, and they have been obliterated. We have four or five records of spawning aggregations that have been wiped out in the Caribbean, four or five more that have been wiped out in, in the Pacific, and I, I seriously believe that many, many more have been wiped out before anybody was concerned enough to record the information. In Palau, a few years ago, a rather corrupt chief made a deal with some people from Singapore to come in and fish one of their spawning aggregations of groupers, one of their most important fish, uh, in order to catch them by hook and line, put them in a live tank, water tank, carry them back to Singapore and sell them for a fortune in the live fish trade. The Singaporeans, as is the case with many Southeast Asians, like their fish really fresh, like they're still alive in the tank five minutes before they're cooked and on your plate. In three years, that was the end. Complete obliteration. Uh, spawning aggregations are really vulnerable to overexploitation, so that's why this information is so important. Um, there, there are some good stories, too, that come out that you would never guess, uh, that a biologist would never guess. For example, I told you about the causeways that block the spawning migrations of the bonefish. Those causeways blocked the strong currents that tended to flow in and out with the, with the rising and falling tides. They caused um, fine sediments to settle out in the lagoon, in the vicinity of, of what was once a channel. Changed the characteristics of the bottom in such a way that seagrass, which looks like lawn grass only is, is a little bit taller typically, um, seagrass cult cultivated these areas that were just bare bottom before, and there's a, a, a gastropod, a, a snail that goes about that big that is also an important food in, in this island group that happens to like that kind of habitat. And uh, they thrived, so the causeways were not an unmitigated disaster. Here is a positive example. They have more shellfish now. It doesn't make up for the loss of bonefish, but it's, uh, but it's still a significant plus. Um, now this information was verified. Uh, we never would have known enough to look, however, if we hadn't been told by fishermen. We went back and looked at aerial photographs made by U.S. Uh, military during the Second World War of the whole area, and the seagrass beds stand out very clearly in the photographs. And this was before the channel was blocked, and sure enough, uh, you could see the, uh, the spreading of, of the seagrass beds over time just the way the fishermen told us. And, and this is a very important part of traditional knowledge. You, you must try and verify as much of it, of it as possible, which is really important that 
you either be an expert in the field that you're studying or have at your disposal an ex expert to help you evaluate what's significant and what's not and how to go about verifying it. Because if you don't verify it, um, you know, it's like anything else. If you don't verify it, you can't really be sure it's true. Um, Okay, how much time have I got? I don't have much time left. I think I'll skip a few things. Well, let me tell you a little bit about turtles. This is a, a fun story. I told you about turtles always returning to the same beach, and this being discovered by Archie Carr centuries after fishermen around the world, around the tropics, knew it. In Palau, um, in Micronesia, they had a legend about how this laying cycle was first described. And turtles, like fish, tend to have a lunar laying cycle. They tend to lay every approximately 28 days, which is, this, which is the same number of days between one full moon and the next. And the story goes that uh, a woman from one village and a man from another had a rendezvous on a uh, deserted beach.